Hi, my name is Stephen Downs. Thank you for inviting me to talk to Hackademia today. It's a pleasure to be here. I'd like to talk about learning and connectivism in massive open online courses. This isn't going to be so much of a, a technical talk. I want to talk about what learning is like in a massive open online course, or at least what learning is like from my perspective. And I think the best way to start that is to think about how I see the world. And I see the world as this, this great, well, I don't want to say great forest, but as this complex, interconnected, interwoven environment. I see the world in its many facets, in its many forms, as something diverse, as something that's open, something I can interact with, something that I can play around with and enjoy. More to the point though, the way I see the world is itself as people, things, concepts, and so on, all connected to each other. And also, the way I see the world, and the actual mechanisms I use to see the world, are not simply, as we might say, the five senses, you know, seeing, touch, sight, etc. But, you know, I see the world with my brain. I see the world with my neurons and my connections between the neurons with each other. And the really important point here, and the point where the interaction occurs, the point where the learning occurs, is the perception and the communication, the interface between myself and the world. And I think of that as me speaking to the world and the world speaking to me. And this is an important way to understand how I see the world because it's an understanding that isn't based simply on uh, a typical traditional scientific worldview where you do experiments and measure results and it isn't an idea or an understanding of the world based on an idea of worldview or paradigms or things like that. It's just an ongoing conversation between me or whatever I'm looking at and the skills, the abilities, the capacities to understand the world, whether I'm just walking in a forest or whether I'm taking a course, these are in a sense like literacies, ways of comprehending, ways of understanding, ways of communicating. And so that's what a MOOC does for me. What a MOOC does for me what an open online course does for me is it creates a network out there in the world that I can access, that I can interface with, and that I can comprehend. In, in a way, the MOOC almost stands in for the rest of the world. And the skills that are going to be involved in taking a MOOC, navigating this complex collection of content and other people and all the rest of it, these are going to be very similar to the skills and abilities I need in order to navigate through the world. How do I see the world? I see the world not as categories and clusters, not as natural kinds, not as species and genus. I look at the world again as a way of understanding, a way of reading. I see patterns in the world. I see connections in the world. And these gradually, as I become more and more used to them, almost become a language, almost become a way of comprehending the world. I see the signs of things, not signs in a formal semiotic sense, not signs that are models or representations, but signs that are clues, indicators, pointers, things to me that suggest rather than things to me that have any deeper sort of meaning. In connectivism, which is the theory of learning and knowledge that underlies the Massive Open Online course, at least as George Siemens and I have defined it, we've got a pedagogy of, of learning that has to do with making connections, right? and looking at the world, drawing these connections together. And it means making connections, finding connections in the world, making connections, finding connections in our own thoughts and in our own ideas. 
over the years I've tried to refine that to, to state more precisely what I mean by that. And here's a bit of a model that is an overview. Now, the mo this model is not reality. This isn't the way the world is. But it's a bit of a way of slicing and dicing what is really a very complex phenomenon, the phenomenon of perceiving and comprehending the world. It really splits into three dimensions. And I, I think it's important to understand that these dimensions are distinct. Now the borders between them might be a bit fuzzy, but they are distinct. They, they describe different aspects or different attributes of this communication process, this learning process that I'm undergoing through with the rest of the world. On the left hand side there, you see the skills. The skills are the things you actually need to do in an online course like a MOOC. Uh, the, the major categories, aggregate, remix, repurpose, feed forward. These will often talk to the technology specifically. For example, to aggregate, you will need a tool that is an aggregator of some sort. What is an aggregator? Well, it might be an email reader. It might be an RSS reader. It might be Twitter or Facebook. Just some way of gathering content. Remixing, repurposing. Here you're, you're looking at creativity tools, tools that help you author, tools that help you draw, tools that help you join things together, mash things up, remix them and repurpose them. And then finally, feeding forward. These are the tools that allow you to share, to send your content out to other people, to publish it on the web, uh, to email it, whatever. I don't want to focus on the tools in this talk. I want to point to them, say, here they are, here are the things they do, here are the skills that you're after when you're working with them. But I don't want that, I don't want to make that the main focus of what I'm doing here. Similarly with values. The values are the properties of the network that you are attempting to achieve. These are the properties of your own thoughts. These are the properties of any network or learning environment or technology that you're attempting to create. They are in, in order, autonomy, diversity, openness, and interaction or interactivity. You might ask, well, why these values? And again, without going into a long discussion of this, these are the values that enable a network to function. These are the values that allow for change to happen in a network, for new connections to form, for old connections to break, for associations between things to strengthen and weaken. It's the values, it's, it's like the, the principles of thermodynamics that run your car engine or the principles of electromagnetism that run your radio or your computer. These values are the principles that underlie a healthy functioning network. If these, if these values are in place, your network will work and the skills that you use to manipulate the network will be effective. If the values are not in place, if your network is not constructed according to these values, then it won't matter what the skills are. It's like driving, right? If your car engine operates according to the principles of internal combustion, then when you exercise the skill of driving it, steering, braking, etc., the car will move and car will turn. But if your car was designed as a brick, it doesn't matter what your skills are going to be. So that's the skills, that's the values. But then on top of that, and really fundamental to understanding the world, understanding what it is we're trying to learn when we're learning in a connectivist way, are the literacies. The literacies essentially are the principles that underlie comprehension, understanding, and communication. We can think of literacies pretty much the way we think of literacy in terms of language. And we have an intuitive sense of what literacy is in language, right? Uh, a literacy in language is being able to read the language, being able to write the language, being able to understand what something says. When a sentence says, Paris is the capital of France, if you're literate, you're able to form some sort of comprehension or understanding of that. 
What I'm saying here is that in general, there are what we'll call critical literacies that underlie cognition generally, that underlie learning knowledge generally. And I've listed them as follows. Syntax, semantics, pragmatics, cognition, context, and change. Now, as we go through these, we'll, we'll see that these actually break down into many subgroupings. And as we go through these, you'll see that these divisions might be somewhat arbitrary. I might be missing some things here. Something might be overlapping there. That's fine. This is a model. It's not the world. It's not reality. It's just a helpful tool to help you get at the sort of thing that I mean when I'm talking about this. But really, what we're looking at is something a lot more fuzzy, something a lot more, if you will, sub-symbolic, something that is something you feel almost as a capacity, as a way of understanding, as a way of comprehending. But I'll use these words, these descriptions to talk about it, and by the end of the talk, you kind of have an idea of what I mean, and then you can start building on this for yourself and coming up with your own model of the critical literacies. So what I plan to do, I'm going to go through each of these six in turn, and I talk about them for a little bit, and I'll draw out some of what I mean when I talk about them as critical literacies. So let's take syntax. Syntax first is the understanding of patterns or regularities in the world. In language, when we talk about syntax, generally we're talking about rules or grammar. Uh, rules like you know, never end a sentence with a preposition or uh, every sentence must have a subject and a verb or things like that. If we wanted to, we could get into more depth. Uh, we could look at uh, the grammar uh, proposed by Chomsky, for example. We could look at the co-build uh, models of grammar based on actual usage and so on. But when I'm talking about syntax in our language, I'm talking about much more than just grammar. There are many ways we can have patterns and regularities in the world. For example, look out in the world, look out your window or, or look around the classroom even right now. Think about the different forms that you can see. The archetypes. Do you see triangles? Do you see squares? Do you see circles, angles, arcs, tangents, things like that? These archetypes are also a syntax. They're a syntax of visual language, perhaps, or geometrical language. When you discuss with things with other people, do you detect what might be called a logical syntax? The rules of inference, the rules of drawing a conclusion from one sentence to another, the rules or principles of mathematics. Have you ever noticed, for example, that 2 plus 3 is the same as 3 plus 2? That's a regularity, that's a rule. We think of it as a principle, but it's also the sort of thing that we can observe in the world, not just in mathematics, but elsewhere. If a cat is bigger than a dog, is a dog bigger than a cat? Well, you see, now that rule doesn't always apply. So now we need to be thinking about rules and sub-rules and types of rules. Think also of operations. Your processes, methods of doing things. How do you make a hamburger? Well, first you cook the hamburger, then you put the lettuce on the hamburger, then you put mustard, etc. right? Uh, operations or procedures are again a type of syntax, a type of regularity. Think of patterns in the world. I've illustrated some patterns on the left, different patterns of different types of networks. And we could talk about all of those different types of networks that we might see. But you know, I mean, there are all kinds of patterns in the world. Substitutivity is the idea that you can exchange one thing in a pattern for another thing in a pattern. Think about a football team and there's a certain pattern, certain number of players on the field, and if one of them gets injured, you can take him out and put another one in. You still have the same pattern, but now you have different players. That's what substitutivity is. And similarities. Sesame Street in Canada and the United States used to have this great little game they'd play. They'd show four things and they'd sing a little song. Which of these things does not belong? Which of these things is not like the others? 
And what they're doing is they're looking at these four things and getting the viewers to see how they can be similar in different ways. These three things are a food. That thing is an animal. These three things are plants. That thing is a rock. These three things are red. That thing is blue. All kinds of ways things can be similar. Each of these, all of these are a type of syntax. And the literacy here the literacy that we're after is in being able to detect, identify, and follow these patterns in phenomena. There are many different ways of finding these. You know, and it's interesting, we talk about learning theory sometimes. Learning theories are really different ways of trying to find patterns in phenomena. In behaviorism, for example, we find it from learning in practice, memorization, road example. The pattern here is I give you something, you repeat it back. In instructivism, the pattern is a little bit different where I'm, as an instructor, presenting you with already completed patterns or already discovered patterns. I would give you, for example, worked examples. And then you will demonstrate your knowledge of these patterns by responding appropriately and testing. In cognitivist models, we have the importance of models and comprehension. Here we're emphasizing the idea that it's not simply facts, but rather knowledge is composed of representations that we build in the mind. Sometimes representations made out of words and sentences, sometimes representations made up of mathematics and equations. And in constructivist learning theories, the challenge for students is to create their own learnings, to create their own patterns, to build their own models, their own constructions. Why is this important? It's important because the way things are organized in the world is, is important. You know, patterns, regularities, similarities, these underlie the concept of connection and connectivism itself. Daniel O. Hebb said, things that fire together, wire together. What he means by that is connections form between similar things. Connections form when a pattern exists. The actual creation of new ideas, new memories, is the creation of connections that correspond to patterns we've detected in the world. The better we are at recognizing patterns, the better we are at remembering. This is important. A pile of sand is not the same as a sandcastle. And understanding this helps us differentiate and, and talk about sand in different ways. We observe individual entities that are organized. Sometimes we observe individual entities that organize themselves. These are the foundations of structure, order, and things themselves in the universe and they go together to create everything from ant hills to human brains to galaxies. The massive open online course is based on the same idea. It's based on the creation of patterns out of regularities. The underlying tools in a massive open online course will be about making these connections and making it possible for people to be able to link things that are similar or connected in different ways. In massive, the reason why massive open online courses are massive is they're built like a network and the networks grow. The reason why they're open is because a network, properly speaking, has no edges. It's online because this is where we can build these networks. We weren't able to build these kind of networks in a classroom or even in a community. And a course is a way of building a temporary network. The idea here is, and, and think of it this way, a massive open online course is a perceptual system. It's a perceptual system that's made up of a bunch of people known as students and maybe an instructor or two who communicate with each other. But what they are doing together is they are examining the external world, identifying patterns, and by communicating with each other, replicating these patterns in their own course environment. I could, talk, I could talk the rest of my life about patterns, and some people have. 
but I want to move on to the next one because I only have a certain amount of time to talk to you here today. So the next one is semantics. Semantics, you know, properly so called is, uh, is the, the preservation or the representation of truth in a sentence. The simplest type of semantics is what are known as Tarski semantics. Uh, and Tarski said, the sentence, snow is white, is true if and only if snow is white. So semantics imply a relation between what's being said and something external to what's being said. But this kind of relation isn't only ever a truth relation. In fact, there are all kinds of relations we can have between a communication and what is being talked about. The most basic ones of these are things like truth, knowledge, and belief. And these might be based in, in reference to an external world, which is the Tarski semantics, or these might be based in a representation of the, the external world, and, and this is a new kind of semantics. Or they just may be based in a sensation of the world, an understanding of the world. And in fact, any sort of semantics is going to require some sort of interpretation. Well, what that means is, when I say that snow is white is true, what do I mean when I say snow is white is true? Isn't that awful? But there's different ways we can understand that. And, and a good way of getting at that is, suppose I say that there's a 50% probability of snow. Okay, well, what that means, one way of thinking of that is, in all the possible worlds, 50% of them, it snows. Okay, well, that's one way of looking at it. Here's another way of looking at it. In all of our experience in the past of conditions like this, in half of them, it has snowed. You see the difference there? The first one is based on logical possibility. The second one is based on frequency. But here's another one. It comes from Frank Ramsey. And it says, if I had to make a bet, I would bet on two to one odds that it will snow tomorrow. In other words, if I bet 50 cents, I get back a dollar. Well, that's really different, right? That's a, a subjectivist interpretation of probability. The same sort of thing can be said of true, right? Does true mean in all possible worlds? Does true mean... Uh, you know, what happened in the past? Does true mean I bet my life on it? You know, there's different ways of looking at what true means. So, but that's just one aspect of it. In semantics, it's also about learning. How is it that we come to know that something is true? Uh, I, I mentioned earlier the Hebbian theory of association. What wires, or what fires together, wires together. Does that mean then that whatever wires together, that has become an equivalent way of saying that something is true? Well, maybe, maybe not. And again, there are different ways of determining how things wire together. Could be just based on similarity, but it could be based on feedback and correction from the real world. In computer science, we call that back propagation. Or it could be based on underlying laws of nature, harmony, Boltzmann mechanisms, based on the laws of thermodynamics, for example. That might be what makes our networks wire together the way they do. Or, you know, there might be even non- uh, non-natural ways, that's a bad way of putting it, but you know, we might decide that things are true because we vote on them. We might decide that things are true by consensus, or they might emerge, you know, the, the way a crowd rushes to, uh, to see the scene of an accident. Nobody says to the crowd, let's all rush to see the scene of the accident. So everybody kind of rushes that way. So semantics is about the meaning of something, but the meaning of something is about the way of seeing the world. And so what's happening here is in a MOOC, in a massive open online course, we're bringing together many different ways of seeing the world. Frequency, logical possibility, subjective, linking together, wiring together. All of these are equally valid ways of seeing the world. Each one of them just represents a different way of seeing the world. 
the, the real way of seeing the world, if you will, is all of them combined together. It's like the old story of the elephant, right? Each person gets a different experience of the, of the elephant. The only way to know the elephant as a whole is for each person to bring in their way of seeing the world and for everybody to share those and understand those. The whole, in other words, is created by interaction among the parts. That's an important aspect of understanding semantics, especially in learning. Knowledge is not a thing that's transmitted. You don't get a whole single picture of an elephant that I can just take from my head and transfer to your head. It doesn't work that way, right? In each person, the knowledge of the elephant is created again. And each piece of that person's experience contributes to that understanding of the, of the elephant. Inside the mind, it's the same as inside the course. We get these many different perspectives of what an elephant is, and over time, we gradually develop this fully, more full uh, idea or understanding of an elephant. What we learn, therefore, depends on how we interact. And this is where the values that I talked about come in. We're able to learn, we learn effectively if the network is appropriately constructed, if we can get these diverse views, if we're able to draw our own conclusion from these views, if these views are able to access our perception, our understanding without interruption, and if we're able to communicate back and forth with other people, that's how we're able to develop these perspectives of, of elephants, these perspectives of the world. Pragmatics. Pragmatics has to do with use, action, and impact. Knowing something is one thing. Knowing something and being able to use it is quite another. Pragmatics is an aspect of language. Language isn't just about saying things. Language is about doing things. This is something that people like, uh, for example, John Searle or J.L. Austin understood very well. They talk about things like speech acts. If you say something like, I promise that I will go to the store today. You haven't just made a statement, you've committed an act, you've made a commitment. If a person says, I do, when they are being married, the act of saying, I do, is also a formal entering into a contract, just like when they sign their name. There are different kinds of acts that we can do with speech. We can make an assertion, we can give a direction, we can express something, but we can also do harmful acts like harassment, bullying, and the rest. We can do things like ask questions. And even in the asking of questions, we can introduce new facts. In MOOCs, in massive open online courses, it's the same sort of thing. The communication that we're engaged in in a massive open online course isn't simply about stating facts. It isn't simply about expressing things. It's also about doing things. And some of the things that we're doing constitute the process of learning. The process of learning is, is really very simple in my mind. To teach is to model and demonstrate. To learn is to practice and reflect. And it's from those processes that we get the skills to aggregate, remix, repurpose, feed forward. So some of the things that we can do with a MOOC, with this communicative language, is to educate by modeling and demonstrating, by telling stories, by recounting experience, or also to practice and reflect by passing an idea, to pa by demonstrating a way of life. Um, or even by recruitment, by engaging other people and getting them to join. Things we do with MOOCs, as I said, we aggregate, we listen to many diverse sources inside a MOOC. We remix these different perspectives together. We bring the opinion of the carpenter together with the opinion of the plumber and maybe come up with an idea of force and tension in that. We repurpose these ideas. We take them from one field, mix them to another field, and then we feed them forward. We share them with other people. Pragmatics is the things that a MOOC can do as well. A MOOC 
might be a course, but it's also a thing that can ask questions of society as a whole. It's a thing that can be an experiment in itself, like George Siemens and my first MOOCs were. It's a thing that can explore a topic and find a new understanding. This is what we did in the Personal Learning Environments, Networks and Knowledge course, or in the original Critical Literacies MOOC. It's something that discovers new truths, or even, for example, in the case of Jim Groom's MOOCs, it can create new things, like its own radio station. Context has to do with placement environment. Any understanding of communication requires a context. Uh, this is something that, that people like uh, Norwood Russell Hansen or Bosman Frassen or Martin Heidegger understood really well. Uh, for example, if I ask you, why are there grosses growing next to the house? Well, one answer to that question might be because Aunt Sarah planted some bushes. Okay. Another answer might be because there's sunshine and enough rain. Or another answer might be because I thought tulips would not look very nice. You see how each of those answers presupposes a different set of alternatives to the question. This is an idea of context as it's an idea of meaning where the meaning is based not just in the thing itself, but in the range of alternatives, the range of possibilities. And that's what context encompasses. When you understand a language, you don't understand what a word means. You understand as well the range of different other words that could have been used instead. If I say Paris is the capital of France, you understand when I say Paris that I might have said London, Madrid, New York, Rome, Moscow, Podutnik, whatever, right? You understand the range of possible things I could have said instead. I wouldn't say something, and you would think it very odd if I said something like monkey is the capital of France. Then you'd be going, well, what could I have possibly meant by that? Because I'm showing I don't understand the concept. So concepts, or sorry, contacts are the sorts of things that set to mind the range of possible alternatives. There's different ranges of alternatives in different contexts. Explanation, which is what I started with when I asked why are there roses planted outside the house, is one thing. Context may have a range, there may be, it may establish a range of possible meanings. This is something that Quine talks about. Jacques Derrida talks about understanding a vocabulary in terms of the difference, uh, the context, the different things that a word could mean. Uh, or George Lakoff talks about a frame, which is kind of like a worldview, a way of seeing the world which shapes your expectations, shapes your beliefs about what could be the case, what words mean, what metaphors stand for. Context creates possibilities for learning on the internet. The internet itself created a location where networks could form. The on online communities were already being created. This is the context that MOOCs arose in, right? So when you're thinking about learning on the internet, you're looking at, well, what are the range of possibilities? One thing is do a traditional course, but the internet created a much wider context where we could explore different kinds of learning and especially network-based learning. And then we could draw from models and patterns that we've already observed in this context, like open source software, like Napster, like other kinds of sharing networks. Context can also be thought of in, in the sense of where learning takes place. Learning in the workplace, for example, is different from learning in the classroom. There are different objectives, different outcomes that you're after. Learning in the workplace will look at things like the skills gap, informal learning, just-in-time learning. Learning is something that's supported rather than provided. All of these things, because the learning is taking place in a different context, our understanding of what learning means is, is slightly different. Again, context is something I could talk about for a very long time, but I can't because they won't let me. Cognition is our way of reasoning 
inferring or explaining the world. There are four major components of cognition. The one that they teach you in logic class, uh, whether it's formal logic or informal logic, is argument. And it's interesting that when they teach you logic, they teach you this one little tiny piece of literacy, the argument. X, therefore Y. There are different models of argument, different ways we can reach a conclusion from a set of facts. We can deduce it like we do in mathematics, for example. What is 2 plus 3? 2 plus 3 is 5. We have a proof for that. Sometimes we can only induce it. You know, the, the cat came in at 5 o'clock the last five days in a row. So the cat will probably come in at 5 o'clock today. That's a kind of inductive argument. Or you can have an, what, uh, what is called an abductive argument, sometimes known as the inference to the best explanation. I see a set of footprints on the sand. What's the best explanation for that? Given the context, a person walked on the sand. Therefore, there's another person on the island. That's a classic example of abduction. There are types of argument that have to do with possibility and necessity. These are called modal logics or modal arguments. Probability, as I already mentioned. Deontic logic, which has to do with uh, obligations. Doxastic uh, arguments, which have to do with belief and so on. There's a whole range of things called arguments. We also have explanations as different types of cognition. There are different ways of understanding what explains why something happened. Uh, it might be a causal explanation. This caused that. It might be statistical. It might be even an essentialist kind of explanation. Aristotle used to propose those. Why does the rock fall? Because the rock wants to fall. It's in its nature to fall. Not all explanations are good explanations. The other two major aspects of cognition are description, the different ways we can describe an object or a person or an entity or an environment. We can describe it by listing its properties. We can describe it by talking about what it is like. We can describe it by telling a story that has nothing to do with the thing that we're talking about, but we all understand that there's a relation there. And then finally, the ways of defining, defining words, defining terms. All of these are essential elements of cognition. One of the things that learning analytics does for us is that it analyzes performance. It analyzes the possibilities of learning, the likelihood of learning, or whether learning has in fact happened by using some of these cognitive techniques. Analytics typically use machine learning, which is the use of neural network techniques. But this requires an awful lot of data, and very often it also requires that your neural network be taught or trained in order to, to be able to recognize patterns and regularities. So learning analytics is itself presenting or presented with the same sort of challenge that you are as a student. How do you know when you've learned? How do you conclude that you have actually learned something? This is the sort of problem we also have as teachers. How do we infer that someone we have taught has in fact learned? Well, traditional testing is what we normally use, but I would argue, and other people have argued, that traditional testing is a very poor sort of inductive inference. Be just because somebody answers a bunch of questions does not mean that they can become a successful doctor. So how do we, we tell when somebody has learned to become a good doctor or a good cook or a good writer? Well, we don't actually go through a process of testing. In fact, what we do is we recognize that such a person is a good writer, doctor, etc. And, and what that is, is a process of using the entire mind the entire neural network is a perceptual device, right? And what you're doing is you're seeing a similarity in the work that they've done with previous work that you've already acknowledged is expert work. How do you tell if somebody has made a good muffin? Because it tastes like good muffins you've had in the past. This is why in a MOOC, in a massive open online course, 
we do our work openly. We have our communications and our interactions openly and, and we share our work with others so that when we are successful, when we're actually beginning to comprehend and understand the subject, other people can recognize, can see that this work has been successfully accomplished. Finally, let's look at change. Change is, of course, the difference in something that happens from one time to the next. Change has a variety of factors, including graphs, drivers, attractors, and forces. The graphs represent change. The drivers are supposedly things that push change. The attractors are the things that supposedly pull change. And forces are underlying uh, underlying systems or elements that create change. Through history there's been much discussion of change, everything from the relation between connection and relation in the I Ching. You could look at uh, Hegel's discussion of flow through change, look at history as the manifestation of change, and indeed if you take a Hegelian perspective, history is the world coming to realize and understand its own existence. Marshall McLuhan talks about change a great deal. He talks about technical change and he asks questions like, uh, what is replaced by this new technology? Uh, what is augmented by this new technology? Uh, what, what does this new technology make obsolete, etc. The design of games and logical systems, learning patterns, learning designs, these are all ways of designing change. Take a game, for example. One type of game is the branch and tree, where you go through the game and every once in a while you have to make a decision. And de depending on the decision you make, you might go in a different direction. Well, what the game is doing is defining a series of changes that take place as you play the game. Scheduling is about change. Activity theory is about change. Change in a system. To understand change means understanding the varieties of change. Everybody, at least initially, thinks that things will always be the same. And then when things are changing, they think that change will be linear. If something's changed, it will continue to change. But we understand that change isn't like that. Sometimes change is very sudden. And, and Gladwell talked about that in the tipping point where the forces that lead to a change gradually build and build and build until suddenly we have a change. Earthquakes are like that. An earthquake is a very sudden change that occurred once a tipping point has occurred. Sometimes changes go back on themselves. Think of a wave, for example. A wave goes up, a wave goes down, a wave goes up, a wave goes down. But in a flood, the wave goes up, goes down, and then up further it goes down, and up further and it goes down. So sometimes changes may look like they're going up and down, but might actually be progressing toward a certain point. What are the consequences of change? What are the consequences of a MOOC? And here we have the four questions that Marshall McLuhan asks. What do, what do MOOCs enhance? openness perhaps, interactivity perhaps. What things do they reverse? Well, perhaps the, the traditional practice of, of teaching by talking to people in a classroom. What things from the past do MOOCs retrieve? A lot of people have talked about the MOOC in terms of the revival of the apprenticeship system of learning, the revival of learning by practice or learning by doing. And what do, make, what do MOOCs make obsolete? Well, perhaps uh, the test. Uh, perhaps other things. It, it's hard to say, right? These are questions that I can't necessarily answer for you, but when you look at these technologies, you want to look at these different aspects of technologies. What makes change happen? You know, we, we tend to think of the world is being pulled in one direction of ourselves being pulled in one direction. You know, it's kind of like gravity. Gravity always pulls us down, right? But you know, what actually happens in the world is the things that are pulling us to change 
are sometimes themselves moving and sometimes they're not moving in an ordered and static way. That's, that's, those are known as attractors and the things that move in a chaotic, unpredictable way are strange attractors. It's sort of like you're the cat chasing a chasing a laser beam, right? And the cat's chasing the laser beam, but the laser beam keeps moving around. And so you sometimes feel like a cat chasing a laser beam when you're trying to understand change. You know, there's no way necessarily that we can predict, but we can understand what matters to us. We can understand what's important to us. For the cat chasing the laser beam, the point isn't to catch the laser beam or to even know where the laser beam is going. Really, the purpose is to interact with the person who's shining the laser beam because the cat knows. The cat knows who's doing it. So that's how I see the world. I see the world through these literacies. I see the world as, as patterns. I see the world as, as meanings of values and objectives. I see the world in terms of the things that I can use it for and the things that I can do in the world. I see the world in the sense of different contexts, different perspectives, different frames, through different metaphors, through different eyes. I see the world in terms of the predictions I can make about it, the explanations I can draw about why things are. And I see the world as something that isn't static, doesn't stay the same, but something that moves forward continually in one direction or another direction, sometimes like a cat chasing a laser beam. I see the world as a stage. I see the world as a platform on which I can act and interact and relate and talk and understand and communicate. To me, you know, this, this conference, this talk is about technology, but to me, the underlying principle of technology is always the literacies. I said in the talk the other day, a technology is just the pointing end of a model. And what I mean by that is the technology is only the thing that comes out at the end of your understanding and comprehension and communication of the world. If you are literate, then the technologies you create will be literate. If you genuinely understand these aspects of the world, then the technologies that you create will be useful and helpful and worthwhile. Thank you for your time. I greatly appreciate you being here to talk to me today, to listen to what I've had to say. And of course, if you have any comments or questions, I would be happy to answer them.